The supreme duty of man is the salvation of the soul. Man is a twofold being. He is a soul that is immortal and eternal. The soul will live forever while the body in which that soul is housed will decay and return to the dust from whence it came. We cannot preserve the body, but we must preserve the soul. At Hebrews 10 and verse 39, the scripture says, But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. We save the soul through belief. Faith in God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, a commitment to the divine principles that are contained in His Word. In James 5 and verse 20, the Scripture says that he that turns the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. The soul is to be saved from eternal death which will be the consequence of sin. The Old Testament prophet Ezekiel said, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But through our repentance and through our obedience to the will of God, we save the soul from death. In Luke the twelfth chapter and the twentieth verse, Jesus tells the story about an individual who thought more about earthly things than he did the salvation of his soul. As he looked at the accumulation of his earthly possessions, Jesus said unto him, This night thy soul shall be required of thee. At one point in time our soul shall be required of us. We shall leave the walks of men, the body shall decay and return to the dust, but the soul shall return unto the God who made it. He will require that soul of us. In Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26, Jesus the Christ explained the worth of the soul. He said, If any man would come unto me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever would save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life in this world shall save it. For what shall a man be profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? As Jesus explains the conditions of discipleship, He declares unto us the worth of the soul. If we would gain the whole world, if we would be able to accumulate all of the wealth, all of the power, and all of the success of the world, and lose our soul, what profit would lie therein? The Bible explains to us, as it does with all topics, how we can secure the salvation of the soul. We must ensure our soul's salvation. We must make certain in this life that our soul is secure with Almighty God. As we sing that hymn, It is well with our soul, we must make certain that indeed it is. We must make our calling sure if we would save our soul. We must know that we are in Christ rather than being out of Christ. We must know that we have conformed to the will of God rather than being opposed to the will of God. In 2 Peter 1 and verse 10, Peter said, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Peter calls upon his readers to give diligence to the security of their soul. The salvation of the human soul requires diligence on our part. There is that which we must do and that to which we must be committed in order to secure the salvation of our soul and make certain that our soul is secure in the safe haven of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
give diligence to make our calling and election sure. We make certain of our election as we examine the Word of God, as we look at the will that God has revealed unto us, as we examine the precepts and the statutes and the ordinances and the commandments that He has given, and know that we follow those commandments and those ordinances and obey those laws that He has given, we can secure our election and make certain our calling. In 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 4, Knowing, therefore, brethren, beloved, your election of God. God elects us to salvation. He calls us to that election through the gospel of Jesus Christ. As one hears the gospel, believes the gospel, and obeys the gospel, he becomes the elect of God, the chosen of God. God has chosen all of humanity to be saved through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That gospel is to be proclaimed, that message of salvation, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is to be heard, received into the human heart, obeyed in the life, and followed throughout life, and salvation is secure. Our election is to be known. We are to be certain that we are the elect of God. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12, the Apostle Paul confessed, For I know him whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. <clears throat> the Apostle declares that he knows the one whom he has believed, being Jesus Christ. We can know whether that we have believed on Christ through the teaching of the New Testament. Obedience to the gospel of Christ is a very clear, precise message revealed in Holy Scripture. As we obey that truth, then we can know Him whom we have believed. And Paul was persuaded that God was able to keep that which he had committed unto his hand. The apostle was fully persuaded of his salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. He had made a commitment to the God of heaven concerning the security of his eternal welfare through Jesus Christ. We must do that to make our calling and our election sure. We must live life with the same certainty, the same conviction, the same expectation that our soul is secure in Almighty God. In Psalms 23 and verse 6, David spoke of his sure calling when he said, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We are to live life with that assurance, with that conviction, that God's goodness and God's mercy is going to follow us all the days of our life. As we follow God, God will bestow upon, his, upon us His goodness and His mercy. <clears throat> we will experience constantly His kindness, His benevolent grace and mercy. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As we go through life, as we see age come upon us, as we experience a decline in health, we are to be sure that we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul said, For we know that if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. This is certainty. This is full expectation. We know that this earthly house will be dissolved. We know that one day we must move out of this earthly tabernacle in which we now abide. And when that occurs, we have a building from God, 
a house not made with hands. A house made with hands will become dilapidated. It will come in need of repair. It will soon decay and fall away. But a house made by God, eternal in the heavens, that must be our surety, the salvation of our eternal soul. In 1 John 5 and verse 13, John said, These things write I unto you, who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. John was writing this epistle so that those who read this epistle would know that they believed on the name of the Son of God and through that belief they had eternal life. Eternal life is not to be that which we hope will come, but rather that which we expect to come. Eternal life must not be that which we hope comes, but that which we are assured will come. To save the soul, we must make our calling sure. But to save the soul, we must labor to enter heaven's rest. In Hebrews 4 and verse 11, the writer said, Let us therefore labor to enter into that heavenly rest. God has prepared a heavenly rest for His people. The writer looks at that earthly rest toward which the people of God pressed in the Old Testament. God had promised the land of Canaan to the descendants of Abraham. They had to press toward that land. They had to labor to enter into that land. But God has prepared for His people, the church, today an eternal rest, a heavenly rest. Let us therefore labor so that we might enter into that rest. There must be work involved in the kingdom of God. We must give ourselves to the labor of the salvation of the soul. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 6, <coughs> the Apostle Paul said, The husbandman that laboreth is first partaker of the fruits. In this writing, the Apostle is looking at the labor of a husbandman, one who tends to the vineyard, who takes care of the crop. That husbandman must labor in order to receive the reward of harvest. If we're going to have an eternal harvest, then we must labor in the kingdom of Almighty God. He has called us to be workers in His kingdom. We are to be active participants in the church of our Lord. In 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 58, the Apostle said, Be ye therefore steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. The Apostle in this passage of Scripture, as he contemplates the resurrection of the human body into future glory, speaks of the work of the Lord. God has a work for His people. Jesus said, I must work the works of Him that sent me. Jesus came to do the work of God. And so the church of today, even as the church of yesterday and the church of tomorrow, has been sent into the world to work. There is an individual labor that must be performed in order to inherit the kingdom of God. There is a call to labor in the kingdom of God that Jesus Christ has issued to His followers. The early disciples were given a place of labor in the kingdom. 
We have a place of labor and work in the kingdom. It is an individual responsibility that we are called upon to perform so that we might enter into that heavenly rest. We must see that rest and we must labor for that rest. We must involve ourselves in the conquest of that rest. And we must be steadfast always abounding in the work of the Lord so that we might know that our labor in the Lord is not in vain. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 9, the Apostle Paul is speaking about that eternal house that has been created by God for the faithful of, in Christ Jesus. He contemplates being in the body and being absent from the Lord. And when we are with the Lord, we are absent from the body. He said, Wherefore we labor, that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of Him. We are either present with the Lord, having already moved out of this earthly body, or we are absent from the Lord, still abiding in this earthly body. We labor so that we might be accepted of Him. We are accepted of God when we labor in His vineyard. He wants us to be workers involved in the kingdom of God. In 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 8, the apostle says, He that soweth and he that watereth are one, and God shall reward every man according to his labor. We labor in unison. We cooperate with one another. We use the various talents that we have been given so that we might bring glory and honor to Almighty God. We exert our energy and our time in the kingdom of God. We seek to glorify God through the labor that we perform. And we are one in the performance of that labor. But... Even though we be one, God shall reward every man according to his own labor. The reward of heaven will be given to each individual person for the labor that he or she has exerted in the kingdom of God. If we are going to enjoy that heavenly rest and secure the salvation of our soul, we must labor to enter into that heavenly rest. And we also must be faithful unto death. Death will end our earthly pilgrimage. Death will end our labor in the kingdom of God. In Revelation 2 and verse 10, Jesus said to His church, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee the crown of life. We noticed a passage a moment ago in Hebrews 10 and verse 39. But we are not of them that draw back unto perdition. We can draw back. We can fall away. We can fall by the wayside. We can turn again. We can go back into the land of sin from which we have been rescued by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are to be faithful unto God unto death. The reward comes at the end of a faithful life of service unto Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 4 and verse 19, the Apostle Peter said, Wherefore commit the keeping of thy soul unto Him as unto a faithful Creator. We are to commit our soul unto the safekeeping of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to maintain that commitment throughout the whole of our life. Once we have made a commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ, we are to keep that vow that we have made unto Him. We are to maintain fidelity in the kingdom of God. The devil will seek to lure us away from Christ. The world will call us to service so that we might turn aside from the Lord Jesus Christ. 
but throughout our life, all the days of our life, until our life is finished, we are to maintain fidelity in the kingdom of God. In Hebrews 3 and verse 6, the scripture says, But Christ is a son over his own house, whose house are we? If we keep the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end, we are the house of the Lord Jesus Christ. If, if we maintain the keeping of the faith firm unto the end, our reward for faithful service comes at the end of life. The crown of glory will be bestowed at the end of life. We must not turn aside. We must not fall away. We must not surrender, but rather we must maintain our fidelity to the Lord Jesus Christ all the days of our life. In Hebrews the 10th chapter <coughs> and the 36th, 35th and 36th verse, the writer says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. Cast not away therefore your confidence. Do not throw away your confidence. Look at Judas Iscariot and how he threw away his confidence. For 30 pieces of silver, Judas Iscariot traded in his commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ for that worldly possession. He cast away the recompense of reward. Ye have need of patience. You have need of endurance. The Christian life requires endurance. For we must fight against Satan's temptations. We must overcome difficulty and disappointment. We must deal with the adverse conditions of life. We must deal with the persecutions that come upon us because of our service to the Lord Jesus Christ. We have need of patience that after we have done the will of God, we will receive the promise. The promise is not given until after we have performed our service unto the Lord Jesus Christ. In Hebrews the 10th chapter and the 23rd verse, the writer said, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. We are to hold fast our profession of faith without wavering. We are not to waver in our commitment to the Lord, but rather we are to stand fast in the faith. We are to hold securely the promise that God has given unto us. We are to remain strong and standing fast in service to the Lord Jesus Christ. He is faithful that promised. Knowing the faithfulness of God, knowing that God is going to fulfill the promise that He has made unto us, being assured of the promises that God has given unto us, we are able to remain faithful and strong in His service and not turn aside from following Him and being allured back into the world. In Revelation 2 and verse 25, the Lord God has analyzed the church at Thyatira. God has seen their work, their patience, their charity, their faith. He is mindful of their service to Him. But also He is aware that some have accepted false doctrines. He is aware that the depths of Satan are there at work against His church. And in verse 25, he says, For what ye have already, hold fast till I come. Satan was working against the church at Thyatira. 
But God wanted them to hold fast till I come. We will be delivered into that eternal world one day if we hold fast our faith firm unto the end against all the adversaries and all the depths of Satan in this present life. Our priority in this life is the salvation of our soul. Of all that we save, of all that we secure, of all that we ensure, we are to make certain that it is our eternal soul. Let us do that by making our calling sure, by laboring to enter heaven's rest, and, uh, and by being faithful unto death. Our journey begins with our obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ through faith, repentance, confession, and immersion in water. We become a child of God, having escaped the pollutions of the evil of the world, having been added to the Lord's church, and having this wonderful promise of eternal life in heaven after the judgment has come. We offer that invitation as we stand and sing this hymn.